Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Allie Wright, and I am the program assistant at the Georgia Center for the Book. Um, if you come to our programs regularly, you're used to seeing Joe Davidge's face. Um, I know uh, he is, um, I stay behind the scenes. I don't love being on camera, but I'm here tonight because Joe is uh, without a voice. So you get me, I'll be your host for the evening. Um, we have some excellent programs coming up. I'm gonna take a second to tell you about ours on January 25th. We'll be welcoming the book launch for uh, Kimberly Jones and her book, How We Can Win, Race, History and Changing the Money Game That's Rigged. That's on January 25th, um, it'll be on Zoom. Um, it's based off of her viral clip from 2020 and it's gonna be a really great evening. So for more information about that event and everything else we, come, we have coming up, um, I hope you'll join us that again, um, that's on January 25th and you can find out more on our Eventbrite page. Um, for some housekeeping notes, if you need live transcription for this event, it is turned on. Um, you can um, adjust the size and location of the words on in your toolbar. Um, also, if you have any questions for tonight's author, please put them in the Q&A. Um, we'll, he'll, um, he'll answer them at the end of our presentation. If you'd like to purchase a copy of the book, um, there's a link to the chat in the chat to the author's website, which has places where you can pick up a copy of the audiobook. Um, we also have several copies in the DCPL collection. So if you want to go the library route, that's always an option. Um, remember too that this event is being recorded. It will be up on our YouTube page tomorrow. So if you want to um, revisit it or share it, you can do that. We also have a link to the clips you're going to hear because we're going to get to hear from the audiobook of this book tonight. Um, we're going to put a link to some of the clips in there, or you can watch the recording tomorrow. Uh, I think that's all of the housekeeping things. Um, let me introduce you to tonight's author. Philip Goodridge um, is with us to discuss his new audiobook, uh, Somerset, Benjamin Franklin and the Masterminding of American Independence. Philip Goodrich is a practicing general surgeon and has been active on phys physician forums for the past 15 years. This is his first foray into the realm of narrative American history, though he has always been an American history buff. And he graduated from Northwestern University and the University of Southern California. He has spent countless hours in research of American history, which I think you will be able to tell tonight as you can hear some of his book. Um, he is joining us from where he lives in Missouri. Philip will be telling you um, about his book. And then, like I said earlier, we will get to hear some clips from the actual audiobook with Philip's commentary. And then we'll have time for a Q&A at the end. And so that's all you need from me. I'm going to turn it over to Philip. Welcome, Philip. And um, I'll be back at the end to help with questions. Thank you, Ellie. I appreciate that kind introduction. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with your audience tonight. Uh, yeah, my name is Philip Goodrich. Uh, I am uh, a historian focusing now on uh, early American history and particularly the American Revolution. This all stemmed from uh, looking at a little anthology long since forgotten called Stories You May Not Have Known About the American Revolution or Little Known Stories About the American Revolution, something along those lines. But one of the things that it talked about was a case settled in the uh, London court system called Somerset versus Stewart. And I confess to you that at that time, I had never heard of the case of Somerset versus Stewart. So I was intrigued, like all uh, red-blooded Americans. As soon as I got home, I Googled it. And I was stunned with what I was reading because the uh, uh, basis of this case was felt by some authors to be the primary basis for the initiation of the American Revolution. So I immediately started uh, pursuing that uh, angle of this story and the story rapidly unspooled thereafter. Uh, it turned out that there was a common source, not only for that aspect of the story, but for a secondary aspect of the story called the Hutchinson Papers. And between the Hutchinson Papers and the Somerset versus Stewart decision, uh, an, an American revolution was launched, as you know, in 1776. So um, once I had put this out as a print book, multiple people approached me and said, you know, 
I don't read books anymore. I listen to books. So my publicist and I realized very soon after we put out the early uh, print book that we needed an audio format for it. Um, my publicists were skeptical, but they were willing to pitch it to uh, directors and publishers in uh, uh, New York. And much to our excitement and surprise, an experienced uh, director producer named Mae Wethrich agreed to take on this project. Once she agreed to do this, she uh, had multiple meetings with me and she assured me that uh, audiobook uh, was now uh, a concept that required a full cast. It wasn't a single reader anymore. You really needed to cast the book. And to that end, she needed much more dialogue than we had. Uh, much of the dialogue that's provided, including what you're going to hear tonight, was actually provided in the papers of Benjamin Franklin and are directly taken from Benjamin Franklin's own writing. But we also uh, took the liberty of adding dialogue without sacrificing any of the history. So the history remains, but as so many uh, people in our, uh, in our multimedia will tell you, we have added dialogue simply for the sake of interest and to, uh, to keep the reader engaged. Um, to that end, uh, once we release this, she advised me that now we're going to have to pull back the print version. So the print version has been pulled back, but I'm proud to tell you tonight that the new print version, which coincides with the audiobook, is going to be launched within the next uh, one to two months. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you then to the uh, various clips that you're going to hear. Our first clip comes from the parlor of Dr. John Fothergill. You may not know that name, John Fothergill, but he was Benjamin Franklin's personal physician in London while Franklin was there. And uh, at the same time, he was probably the busiest physician in London at that time. We're going to take you into his parlor in March of 1772. And uh, you're going to hear Benjamin Franklin talking with not only Dr. Fothergill, but with also his closest friend in London, a man named Thomas Pownall. You may not know Thomas Pownall either, but Thomas Pownall had already served in the American colonies as the Lieutenant Governor of New Jersey, the Governor of Massachusetts, the Governor of South Carolina, and had turned down being Governor of Pennsylvania. So he knew the colonies almost better than Franklin did. So we're going to start then with this clip between Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Pownall, and John Fothergill. Thank you, Joe. In March of 1772, Franklin grew frustrated and angry. At age 66, he was already exhausted by the mundane tasks of his daily routines and feared his opportunities to achieve his goal of freedom for Pennsylvania were slipping away. The crown was clearly not going to wrench his province from the hands of the hated Penn family, and Parliament was simply disinterested in the matter any consideration of manumission of American slaves appeared exhausted. The crown enjoyed the fruits of slave labor to bolster its global economy and was not going to move to upset that delicate balance of relative immorality for relative wealth. And Parliament was not inclined to make any movement to end slavery in Great Britain and was not empowered to press toward manumission in the colonies. It truly appeared that Franklin's efforts had reached an impasse. He was staring up a blind alley, and there were no doors to enter. One night, at a dinner meeting of the inner circle in late March, his anger overflowed, and he lashed out. Just one! Just one slave! And perhaps we could still build this! Dr. Franklin, this simply cannot happen. We have tried everything. We have made a noble effort toward your goal. And we simply have exhausted our remedies. 
I have nothing further to suggest. Pownall and Franklin sipped their ale. Clearly, they had already identified a potential motivation for the plantation owners in the southern British colonies to join the cause of Massachusetts in separation from the crown. The letters were waiting in Benizet's school in Philadelphia. The ensuing silence was pervasive, and almost everyone present fell victim to their despair. But then a voice from the other side of the table. Dr. Franklin, thou hast said one. Is that correct? It was the naturally tremulous, timid, but eloquent voice of John Fothergill. Pray go on, Doctor. Well, there is a man here in London that may be able to deliver thee but one, manumitted. What? How? There is a man named Granville Sharp, a mirror of thine own Antony Benizet in Philadelphia, but more legally inclined, an Anglican, working steadfastly, but so far unsuccessfully, at legal manumission through the courts. Now Franklin sat upright, intrigued. Yes, I've heard of this Sharp, but have yet to meet him. All the same... I am aware of dear Benizet and his efforts for unfree persons and Native Americans in Philadelphia. He works to support them and to educate them, but certainly has neither the inclination, nor the resources, nor the background to pursue legal remedy in the colonial courts. It would be difficult to conceive of a like-minded individual here in London who would have a better chance of it. Father Gill gently contradicted him. Oh, but it seems that Sharp is something of a self-taught solicitor, and an exceedingly bright and talented man. He has appropriated for himself an extensive knowledge of English common law, and now has the ear of a key jurist on the king's bench. They are said to be working together quietly to identify the case that will reveal to all Great Britain the immorality and failed social contract of human slavery. Franklin slumped down again, demonstrably skeptical. There is no such jurist on King's Bench. They are all sworn to adjudicate their cases in support of the crown, serving as agents of the king, as they understand their role on the bench. Ah, yes, Dr. Franklin, that is true. But there is one. And, pray tell, who is this enlightened jurist of yours, Dr. Fothergill? None other than the Chief Justice, Lord Mansfield. The room fell silent. But I must implore thee, humbly, Dr. Franklin, do not attempt to contact, far less intervene with Sharp at this point. He works in the shadows of Mansfield, much as we honest Whigs work with thee, and at the first signs of disturbance is forsworn to abandon his mission, and will, as he is a quite moral and upright individual, in thy zeal thou couldst readily accomplish quite the opposite of thy stated goal. Pray, let him work in secrecy. I trust you will be able to keep us apprised of his progress in this mission, Father Gill? Only as much as I am able. He is a very quiet and thoughtful man. Franklin looked straight at Father Gill. Once again he had to trust, and he so dreaded this dependency but this was all that was left, and he simply had to press on, entrusting to a stranger and an obscure young barrister the entire success of his revolutionary plan. Shall we press on, Dr. Franklin? Franklin responded blankly, We have no other option, Pownall. Where do we stand in the colonies? There is currently a likelihood that Parliament, having rescinded the Townsend levy, will initiate a new taxation on the surplus British tea burgeoning daily in our warehouses and ports, in so doing to leave a symbolic levy to assert Parliament's ability to further assess levies on the colonies. 
and at the same time to unload the excess tea upon the reliable American market. My God, how your people drink the stuff. The behaviour in the colonies in response to the stamp tax and the Townsend levies have not been soon forgotten nor forgiven by many of my colleagues. And what, pray tell, will retention of a symbolic levy accomplish in Boston and Philadelphia? Parliament desires to remind the colonials of their position and their subservience to their monarch, and will hear of no other stance in this regard. I anticipate that this will indeed be the outcome of the pending legislation now in the Commons. Franklin eased back, thoughtful, and then smiled. Samuel Adams will have his day on this one. Franklin was not a born revolutionary. That indisputable designation fell to two men in Massachusetts, both named Adams and both living in Boston, but no more closely related than second cousins. So we leave that topic for now. We are going to take you at this point to the parlor of Granville Sharp. What you're going to hear here for the first time is the enslaved man, James Somerset, coming for the first time to the home of the most uh, prevalent and, uh, and well-known abolitionist in London, uh, an Anglican named Granville Sharp. Uh, and their dialogue follows. Uh, this all took place in January of 1772. So Joe, I'm gonna let you take it from there. When Somerset appeared at the door of Granville Sharp on that cold afternoon in January 1772, Sharp could plainly see that Somerset was in need of more than guidance. The events of the past month, his capture, bonding, and restriction in the London abolitionist house with strangers had put a palpable strain on him. Somerset was now under a surety bond one of the highest ever assigned by the British court in a matter deemed so apparently trivial, and Sharp knew that this placed the finances of Elizabeth Cady and the safety of Somerset, who could be seized and sent to Jamaica, under dire threat. Sharp ushered him into his home, assured him his was a safe house, and invited him to sit before the fire where he was offered a cup of tea. I am pleased to make your acquaintance, Mr. Somerset. Let us discuss your court appearance, but before we do, please tell me where you have been staying this past month. Master Sharp, before I was taken up by the bounty men, I was living in Southwark with free blacks and trying to avoid bounty gangs. The blacks stay in closest under the streets and we work on the docks for food. We got to be off the street by dark, and we don't talk to no one we don't know. There are some blacks that have been in Southwark for years, and they're pretty much in charge. They look out for us and tell us where we can go. The memory of the Thomas Lewis debacle was still fresh in Sharp's mind, and he could not well afford a similar outcome with Somerset. In order to press for his legal manumission, Sharp had to be absolutely certain that Somerset was indeed a fugitive slave. To that end, his questioning of Somerset quickly became more focused. Tell me, how did you come to be sold into slavery to Charles Stewart? Well, sir, I was born in Africa, but I, I don't remember a lot about it. I worked on the rice farms there, and a group of young boys and me were taken to Saraloa, one day by wagon, a couple of those boys tried to run and, and was beaten. 
He didn't try that no more. Yes, go on. What happened from there? We were taken to the harbor and put inside a ship. We were many young boys and girls all crowded in a dark place, all of us scared. You were taken to Virginia? Uh, no, sir, not then. They took us to an island they called Barbados, and when the ship stopped, they threw open the doors and let us out onto the deck. There were a lot of white men there, and they looked at us and poked us and looked in our mouths and looked in our eyes. They tied strings around our necks with a little paper card that had letters and, and numbers on it. Are you able to read, Mr. Somerset? Yes, sir, I read English pretty good, but I, I don't let on. We aren't supposed to know about white things. How did you come to be in Virginia? Well, one of the men in Barbados took us to a sugar farm. We worked hard every day, sun and rain, sometimes awful hot. Some of the boys would faint in the heat, and they would get beat. I tried to do my best so I would not get beat, but sometimes I did anyway. Some of those boys died. Some of us got fever. If we sweated and had fever, they let us rest. They said we were being seasoned and didn't care if we got sick or not. I was on that island for over a year. And then one day, other men came to the sugar farm. They took eight of us boys in a wagon and then to a ship in the harbor and put us inside again. That was the ship that landed in Norfolk. And is this where you met Mr. Stewart? Yes, sir. They took us to the middle of town, and some men talked, and some men shouted, and then Mr. Stewart come and had me follow him home. I lived with him from that day. So did you understand that he had purchased you as a slave? I didn't, just then. I learned it pretty quick. There was no question by the time I was a grown man that white people in Virginia owned a lot of black people and that I was owned by Mr. Stewart. I worked for him as a valet and as a clerk. That's where I learned to read and to work numbers pretty good. How did Mr. Stewart treat you? Oh, he was always pretty good to me. He bought me nice clothes, not like them farm slaves that wear homespun and such. I lived in a little cabin behind his house in Portsmouth. But others had it terrible. And he was clear that he was the master and I was in bondage to him. He told me to call him Master Stewart, and I did. How is it that you and Mr. Stewart came to be in London? Well, Master Stewart collected taxes in Norfolk. Folk generally seemed to like him, but about five or six years ago, folks started getting angry about taxes and such. I didn't understand all of it, but one day, Master Stewart say, we going to Boston. They have soldiers there who will protect us from these American colonists. And so we moved to Boston. Now, me, I thought Master Stewart was an American colonist, but he say, nah, we're British, and we work for the king. So what transpired in Boston? Well, Master Sharp, he opened an office there, and we worked there for more than a year, collecting taxes and whatnot, but then people in Boston got real angry, and sometimes they would break the windows in the office and shout at Master Stewart in the street, and sometimes they would call him names and point at me. After a while, Master Stewart became sickly, and he was scared. By and by, he said he couldn't work there no more either and that we had to go to London. So we got on a ship and we came here. Do you remember when that was, Mr. Somerset? Now, Sharp was taking mental notes. Even in this brief conversation, he was convinced that here was the bondsman, articulate and clearly in bondage, who could provide the perfect case to press for manumission in the court of King's Bench. That would have been two years ago. Master Stewart opened an office in London and didn't collect taxes anymore, but he managed accounts for merchants in the city. Nobody shouted at him in London, and we got on pretty good. I took his laundry and did the marketing, and sometimes I would work at the office too. But you know, when I would do my errands for Master Stewart, 
the free blacks in Southwark would accost me and make fun of me and talk to me about being in bondage. I knew they were right. And then I found out that if you get baptized, they have to set you free. So one day I went into St. Andrews and the priest baptized me and called me James Somerset. And I don't tell Master Stewart for a few weeks. But then I say, I've been baptized and my name is James Somerset. He looked at me kind of funny and not say anything. Something changed after I became James Somerset. Master Stewart started fretting and worrying and just, well, treating me different. And this past October, what took place then? Well, one day, Master Stewart gave me money for the laundry and the marketing and to buy some clothes for him and me. And I say, yes, sir. But as I walked down the street with that money, I kept thinking about it the ships and the beatings and what I'd seen and what the free blacks say to me about how I couldn't eat or lie down or use the necessary anything unless Master Stewart say so. And Master Sharp, it wasn't right. None of it. And I just couldn't take it anymore. Then and there I decided I couldn't go back to Master Stewart's house. That was his home wasn't my home. I ran to Southwark to join the Free Blacks and live with them. And then? Well, the impressment gangs and bounding gangs are all over Southwark. And sometimes they would take Free Blacks and we would never see them again. So we had to hide all the time. One day in November, I was on the street and turned a corner and there they were. They grabbed me and took me straight to Master Stewart. He was powerful angry. Told him to take me right back to Southwark and put me on a ship. He was acting different from the man I knew in Virginia. And I thought, here yeah, I'll go again, just like Africa and Barbados. And I was on that ship for two nights and figured, well, this is it. But then they took me off and I was led to that Lord Mansfield. Some men took me to a private building in London with the windows all covered, and I've been there for the past month. And then they told me to come here and see you. And so, here I am. Indeed, here you are. Well, James Somerset, we are going to find out very soon whether any man has the right to put you or any other man on a ship and send him out of Great Britain. In the meantime, we have much work to do. You are going to meet several men who will be your friends and will help work to make you free. Isn't that what you have been seeking? Oh, yes, sir. More than anything on earth now. I can't ever go back to Master Stewart. He isn't the same man I knew in Virginia. He's just... Wore out. Life just wore him out. And Mrs. Sharp, I'm wore out too. Mrs. Cady has risked a significant amount of money to secure your release, and we must protect your life and her investment. You will need to live at a safe house here in London and must not depart their premises without my direction. It is very important that you do this. Your freedom and indeed your very life may depend upon it. Do you understand? Oh, yes, sir. Master Sharp, I surely do. And one more thing. You must stop calling white men Massa. That day is over for you. I am Mr. Sharp. The other men you meet will also be addressed as Mr. Even Charles Stewart will be, to you, Mr. Stewart. The day of your addressing any man as Massa ceases today. We pray that it will cease for all blacks in Great Britain very soon. Somerset grinned broadly. Oh, yes, sir, Mr. Sharp. Yes, sir. Thank you for your help, and could you thank Widow Katie for me? The conversation now over. The two men departed with Sharp 
escorting Somerset to his new temporary residence in London. Once Somerset was secured at the safe house, Sharp began a flurry of activity at the court of King's Bench. His first order of business was to find Dunning. While the Lewis matter had not ended to Sharp's satisfaction, he felt no malice toward Dunning. Indeed, he felt that Dunning had acquitted himself well and had shown atypical passion in pleading for the freedom of Lewis while condemning the inherent evil of the British slave laws. Here was the perfect barrister to plead for Somerset. Upon arriving at Westminster Hall, he spotted Dunning and approached him. Mr. Dunning, I believe we have finally identified a case of significance that may force a decision from the King's bench on the legality of slavery in the Empire. I would like to tell you about it, in order to secure your services on our behalf. Pray tell, Mr. Sharp, would this matter concern an African Negro who goes by the name Somerset? Sharp was taken aback, and now on his guard. Why, yes, it does. And so you apparently have heard? Indeed, sir, I have, and have been retained by Charles Stewart to serve as his primary defense counsel. Sharp turned crimson and lashed out at Dunning. How can you, of all barristers, support the defense of a slave owner in such a matter? You, who condemned the institution of slavery before the bench not two sessions previously. You? Sir, it would be better for both of us, and for your supplicant Somerset, if we terminated further discourse in this matter. Mr. Stewart approached me two weeks ago seeking my services, and in the spirit of equity and fair representation before the law, I had to agree that he was entitled to due process to the best of my abilities to provide. This is my first duty as a barrister, and I will do no other. Dunning turned and walked away, leaving Sharp to his frustration. Sharp needed time to regather his thoughts, and in so doing, realized here was a worthy cause and a worthy case, and that there were other capable barristers in Westminster who should be willing, in the same spirit as Dunning, to take up the cause of abolition to the best of their abilities. To that end, he began to formulate a list in his mind of the capable attorneys he had heard in his various visits to Westminster, to the Inns of Court, and to Lord Justice Mansfield's Court of King's Bench. That was uh, Joe Morton, who is narrating that section that I've referred to in the audiobook as the interlude. We give you a, a, a ringside seat at the entire proceedings uh, from the Court of King's Bench, and you will hear not only from uh, Sharp, Somerset, and John Dunning, the attorney uh, defending Charles Stewart, but multiple other uh, attorneys involved in the case as well. Joe Morton, we were very excited to have provide this uh, narration for us. And he, of course, is also the voice of James Somerset. I'm going to turn your attention now to two years down the road after Somerset uh, is manumitted by the Court of King's Bench. And we're going to actually take you with Benjamin Franklin to a pub in Covent Garden. Uh, Franklin was of a habit of going to the pubs in Covent Garden on Saturday afternoons just for entertainment primarily. Uh, he enjoyed the relatively raucous crowds there, including the presence of Oliver Goldsmith, the uh, famous London playwright, who was a regular in the pubs there. Uh, it is Oliver uh, Goldsmith that introduces uh, Benjamin Franklin to a bankrupt uh, tax agent there. Uh, an unknown uh, author to much of the world, a man named Thomas Paine. So we're going to let uh, uh, Joe take it from there and we will hear Franklin's meeting with Thomas Paine. Paine, for his part, was fascinated to find himself the subject of interest of Dr. Benjamin Franklin and moved closer for a private conversation. So, do you write in the fashion of Mr. Goldsmith? I am no playwright, 
but I do write lyric. Is this your livelihood? Oh, no. It has provided me with only a modest supplemental income source. And so how do you support yourself? Not well. Franklin was amused. I was an excise man, but I have of late been discharged from my situation. I was in Brighton and noted that the excise men were, to a man, overworked and grossly underpaid, to the point where they fell natural victims to stamping, smuggling and bribery. My fellows sought me out to petition Parliament for a redress of grievances, and this, I regret to say, went poorly. They were most unreceptive, and upon my return to Brighton, I was advised that my frequent absences had accomplished my being turned out. Franklin could certainly identify with the recalcitrance of Parliament. And now? On account of my discharge, I will be forced to sell my assets to avoid debtor's prison. My wife is moving out from our home to her mother's with her remaining possessions. And so now, what is your opinion of Parliament in regard to their willingness to redress grievances for British citizens? Now Franklin was fishing. They are but knaves and scoundrels, without a worthy in their lot that I ever found. Are we not all men? Do we not have rights? I was treated as unworthy, and as a beggar or a thief. I might be able to use a writer, and would be willing to pay you for your service. Would you be willing to accompany me and provide a sketch of your talent? I would be much obliged, Dr. Franklin, but I fear my skills in that regard are meagre at best, and that I have a parliament to prove it. We will see about that. After all, I too have just been turned out from my situation in the colonies. Smiling, Franklin rose and bade Mr. Payne accompany him to Craven Street. Upon arriving, Payne was relieved and then greatly heartened by his reception at Franklin's quarters. Franklin appeared truly delighted to have him, ushered him inside, provided him a meal with fresh hot tea, and later took him to the haberdasher for a new suit of clothes. Franklin then advised Mrs. Stevenson that she would have another boarder living in his quarters for the next few weeks. Then, curtains drawn, Franklin and Payne began to chat. Within the hour, Franklin produced quill and ink and paper and asked Payne to write an impromptu essay on the ills of the excise men. It became quite clear to Franklin, after only this initial dialogue and essay study with Payne, that he was a gifted writer and speaker, he was a zealot for liberty and the rights of the common man, and he was absolutely, hopelessly strapped. In that circumstance, Franklin took Payne into his confidence and by the end of June 1774 had hatched his next plan. It was time to introduce Thomas Payne to the inner circle, and Franklin now invited him to join them at Harper Street. Payne was fascinated and eager to assist Franklin, his benefactor and newfound idol. The following week, Payne and Franklin ventured out together to Harper Street, Bloomsbury, and Payne was immediately smitten by the beauty of Fothergill's home. Dr. Fothergill is my personal physician, and perhaps the single most successful physician of this town. Looking all about him, Payne could barely speak. Yes, he must be. Ushered into Fothergill's private study, the two were greeted by Thomas Pownall and David Barclay, already in Congress. They rose and welcomed Payne, smiling at him and nodding to Franklin. Gentlemen, Mr. Payne has been advised of the purpose of our regular meetings here and is in sworn agreement with all our expectations and designs. So pray tell us, Mr. Payne, of thy intentions here, and thine understanding of thy tasks in service to Dr. Franklin. My lord, I hope to aid Dr. Franklin's cause by conveying his thoughts, and mine, 
to the colonists in America seeking redress of grievances with Parliament. We are together of a mind that the only recourse for the colonials is separation from the empire in order to gain their respect. Anything less at this point would appear to Parliament as capitulation rather than reconciliation and would be greeted with retribution of a most severe nature. I will not betray his kindness nor his trust and will provide service faithfully for your cause until its successful conclusion. I am most grateful to all of you for providing me this unique opportunity in the cause of freedom. Although he had started slowly, Barclay could see that Payne's comfort level had risen as he spoke, and he had noticeably relaxed. Payne was everything that Franklin had promised. Pownall exhaled deeply. This could just work out, and there simply were no other candidates. The ensuing ninety minutes were consumed in a vigorous discussion of the political theories of Hobbes and Locke, as well as those of Montesquieu and Franklin's dear friend, David Hume. I should be indebted to all of you for the opportunity to meet Dr. Hume. All in good time, Thomas. For now, we yet have much work to do. Payne then produced a folio containing perhaps a half-dozen essays on the basis of government and the rights of citizens, written in concert with Franklin over the previous four weeks. His three confederates passed them around and looked through them with growing admiration and wonder. How had Franklin managed to find this diamond in the rough? After two hours, Franklin rose. We have abused your hospitality, Dr. Fothergill, and the hour is late, but we shall be seeing you regularly this summer. For now, you need your rest. And without further discussion, Franklin and Payne departed Harper Street. All right. You'll notice during that little vignette that they have added yet a fourth to their little inner circle of Benjamin Franklin, Dr. John Fothergill, and Thomas Pownall, a man named David Barclay. You may not know David Barclay. He was a very secretive person, but you certainly know his namesake very well. Uh, David Barclay was the founder of what we know today as Barclays Bank. Uh, this is one of the top 25 banking establishments in the entire world, and they continue to be a dominating force on Wall Street. Uh, they were started under the uh, inauspicious uh, uh, beginnings with the Quaker uh, David Barclay. You'll also notice that when David Barclay and John Fothergill speak, they always use the Quaker pronouns. That is not insignificant in the story, as it turns out. But for now, we're going to move you on to uh, Dr. Fothergill's parlor one more time uh, with these four uh, Confederates together because they are looking in, at American uh, Revolution and they realize that they've got a massive problem. So with that, we're going to let you listen in on how they address this massive problem. Franklin, now preparing for departure to Philadelphia, but already mapping an outline of his ultimate destination in France, produced a letter he had recently received for the other three to examine. Written from Charles G.F. Dumas at The Hague, United Provinces, now the Netherlands, the author spoke highly of the colonies and their goal of independence and freedom for the common man. This man, Franklin advised the others, was fluent in five languages and had already made several key contacts in the United Provinces. Further, living in The Hague, he had working knowledge of the labyrinths of European diplomacy and how it worked and what did not work in the cities of London, Paris, Berlin, Vienna, Rome, and Madrid. Finally, he had already worked out a system of encryption of correspondence that made similar concepts appear, frankly, primitive. He had sent Franklin a key and a test. Franklin had failed the test, but his grandson, William Temple Franklin, found it quite legible and, more importantly, 
quite usable. Barclay was immediately intrigued. Already moving toward the financing of a revolution on a massive scale, he knew several things. One, the revolution would require at least six million pounds sterling to keep a military in the field for at least five years. Two, that degree of finance would require a national rather than private purse. Three, no European country would publicly contribute financial support to any colonies in revolt against a legitimate monarchy in Europe for fear of entering into war against that monarchy. Four, the American colonies could not supply their military with weapons or ammunition without the assistance of European firearm sources due to lack of American foundries and factories. Five, Great Britain was currently the largest empire and possessed the most feared and respected military in the world. Six, the British Navy would almost certainly blockade the American Atlantic seaboard, severely restricting the ship traffic in and out of American ports. And seven, the British would be attempting to undermine every effort at American success from the outset of hostilities. And he threw open the table for discussion. Pownall recommended that they take Barclay's list point by point, for the whole made the prospects almost insurmountably impossible. When it was a plan, a nebulous dream, it could be imagined. But laid before us in this fashion, it seems beyond formidable. But if this be thy goal, and if this be the point of our meetings, these issues must be faced, and they must be faced before we can move forward. Otherwise, we are lost. Well, let us then take David's list from the first. How did you arrive at that figure? Thomas, thine own parliament gives us this as the rough cost of the French and Indian War, an effort of seven years. The figures at this point are, of course, immature by half, but this provides a general goal of finance and need for loans or grants from Europe. But that takes us into your second point. Where do we look for this amount of loans? We look to the countries who are most likely to have the funds, and quite frankly, who don't like Great Britain very much. That list is long. France, Spain, the United Provinces, Italy, Russia come immediately to mind. Less likely are Prussia and Austria, who have shared alliances with the Brits of late and have more modest treasuries. But with your third point, if no European country will offer financial support, the plan fails. What can we do with this? Do you think we can achieve a European alliance against the Brits simply to support our revolution? Pownall, for his part, was simply baffled. He couldn't come up with any plausible answer to this dilemma. Barclay smiled. Thou art thinking like revolutionaries rather than bankers. The challenge is to disguise the source of the loans and grants to evade audit. This, I regret to admit, is not a grave challenge in the world of complex European financial transactions. We simply need to employ a common depository inaccessible to audit. There is no such place. <laughs> oh, Thomas, but there is, and thou canst find it in every city in Europe and the Americas. Both Pownall and Franklin were baffled and intrigued. The Roman Curia. It has gone unaudited now for over 1,200 years. The finances of the Roman Curia are so arcane as to defy all the accountants of Europe. The Papists are not going to finance an American revolution. Ah, but Dr. Franklin, they will never know. The Roman Church in France, Spain, the United Provinces, and Italy can serve as depositories, take their 5%, and then deliver the finances to the Continental Congress. It will be extremely clean and clear of audit. His Holiness will likely be unaware. Now Franklin was brightening. What seemed to him and to Pownall insurmountable proved to be little challenge to the financial genius of Barclay. 
The court of Louis XVI can provide access to the finances of the Roman Curia through their commendatory abbots. And at The Hague, your colleague, Charles Dumas, certainly must be familiar with the Abbé Desnoyers, the French minister assigned to The Hague. The Abbé is quite used to controlling finances for Vergen from the protective environs of the United Provinces without raising suspicions. He can serve his crown, his prince of the church, and the Americans quite well. Our colonial military is going to need assistance with materiel, and most assuredly we cannot look to Great Britain. Now, Pownall stepped in. The financial instruments collected in the various countries need never leave Europe. They can be delivered to the weapons and munitions factories of Spain, France, Italy, and the Palatina. No one will challenge the transaction, and the colonies will receive not negotiable currencies and bonds, but rather the material they truly need. Precisely. Negotiable instruments during a revolution might prove too often less than worthless. We will provide thy colonies with what they can use. What of point number five? Britain's military power. What are our plans? We are maneuvering as we speak to assure that Washington is designated the leader of the colonial military. His leadership is essential to our success. He is an integral part of the motivation for the entry of the southern colonies, and his war experience on American terrain is unsurpassed. And he has learned through his experience with that Braddock debacle how to lose a battle without losing an army or a cause. We have spoken with him in the past regarding the strategies learned in the late French and Indian War, about ambuscade tactics, deployment of dragoon forces, and the importance of topographical awareness in siege and fortification. His leadership skills are unequaled. It is absolutely critical that he understands that he is never never to undertake entry into a pitched battle against British regulars. This would be the aim of the British leaders and could cost thee the entire revolution in a single day. Both Franklin and Pownall nodded in agreement. They would regularly remind Washington of the concept, avoid close combat and frontal assaults with the enemy in favor of waging a war of indirection and attrition but Washington was already well-versed in the techniques of the Fabian defense and would execute this defense in expert fashion throughout the ensuing nine years. And what of point number six? How are we to get the materiel to our colonial military? Blockade running would seem to be a risk not worth taking. Suddenly, a different idea struck Franklin. Once again, he was thinking about the French and Indian War and the forks of the Ohio. Fort Pitt. We must take immediate possession of Fort Pitt. That's the key. Barclay was puzzled, but Pownall's knowledge of Pennsylvania geography kicked in. Of course, the Ohio. The Atlantic ports will be difficult to enter and depart, but New Orleans is Spanish territory as is the Mississippi, and the Ohio is, if anything, French territory. We can sail ships up from New Orleans all the way to Fort Pitt, and from there we can distribute arms to the military and all the colonies. In practicality, the Mississippi-Ohio corridor was truly no one's or anyone's territory, but definitely not controlled by the British Empire. This seems like a fantasy. Can this be done? Can a ship's captain bring ships that deep into American territory? Pownall knew the area of the forks of the Ohio and knew that it was, in theory, navigable. Yes, it is possible. Franklin sat, looking up to the ceiling. Who was it? Who was it? Name. Name. Oliver Pollock. Oliver Pollock, of course. All right. Thank you so much again, Joe, for uh, for that montage and for uh, 
directing that. Um, we're going to throw this open for uh, questions and answers for any of you that uh, are curious at all. Um, this, uh, this audio book is going to take you all the way through the American Revolution. It's going to take you through Franklin's time in London, as well as Franklin's time in France, and uh, give you a ringside seat for all the major events. And I think you're going to be very pleasantly surprised to learn that Benjamin Franklin has his imprimatur on virtually every event involving the American Revolution. So I'll throw this back to Allie now for her input. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for that excellent um, sort of overview of the book. I think we get a good kind of tease at what all's in there. Um, if anybody has a question, feel free to put it in the chat or the Q&A and we'll try to get that answered for you. Um, in the meantime, I found it very interesting that you said um, that you had this written as more of a history, um, more straight um, kind of nonfiction, and then you had to turn it into more dialogue and create um, sort of a fictional, fictionalized representation of these events to kind of make it more pop as an audiobook. I'm just curious, what was that like? What was it like to have to put voices to these characters? It seems it came off very authentic. You had to, but you it felt like you had to dig into the time period so much and like really try to get with how they would speak. I'm just curious. Well, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, some critics would say, well, this is no longer historical, but uh, I really took my inspiration from the, uh, the Shara father and son, Michael Shara's book, uh, The Killer Angels. And I don't think anyone would dispute that, uh, that the Shara's uh, trilogy on the Civil War is non-historical. It's highly historical. And yet he has uh, taught us to provide dialogue uh, in key positions just to intrigue the audience and to keep them engaged. Um, to that end, we did rely on the papers of Benjamin Franklin. For those of you unaware, Yale University has done an, an incredible job through the Packard Humanities Institute with assembling over 35,000 documents that carry either the stamp of Franklin himself having written them or people that have written to him and to this day, that mine remains not entirely tapped yet. There's, there's still plenty of material in there for historians to tap into. Uh, I love that kind of stuff. I love archival thing. What was the neatest primary source you got to work with while, while creating this? I, I, above and beyond um, um, the Franklin papers, uh, there were a, a smattering of uh, documents from the Court of King's Bench. And the Court of King's Bench, there was a, a, a writer, he was an attorney named Capel Loft, because they, weren't, they didn't have court reporters then. So they were relying on attorneys that would sit in at the Court of King's Bench and the Court of Common Pleas. And while they were annotating the actual decisions, these were being filled in by these uh, uh, attorneys sitting in in real time and writing as quickly as they could to contribute to posterity the uh, the actual events as they are playing out. And Capitol Loft does a very nice job on the entire Somerset versus Stewart case. He, he provided us probably 90% of the detail. That's very cool. Big responsibility. <laughs> Um, so you mentioned that the print version of the audiobook is coming out February, maybe March, but hopefully February. Yes, hopefully February in conjunction with American History Month and Black History Month. Uh, I've got a, a copy editor and a, uh, and a book designer working frantically as we speak to try to make that happen. Um, and will it be available on your website when it comes out? Like it, will, the it will be available on my website or wherever you normally get your print book. Um, and in addition to the audiobook, just as a further teaser, more research has come out on this since the audiobook itself was published. So you will find four appendixes in the print version that I have <laughs> had to add in since that really brings the entire story full circle. At the end of the print edition, you will be able to tell everybody you know that you know the real story of the American <laughs> Revolution and its ironclad. Uh, well, I love that. It's still be unfolding even after you've written it. Um, Joe has a question and um, it's in the chat. So I'm going to go ahead and read that. Um, before the broadcast, we talked about how deep the records of slavery go in England. 
After they abolished slavery, they still traded with the Confederacy and still have the records of goods and humans trafficked from the US to England back to the South. How did you come to find James Somerset and was any of your research conducted in Europe? Well, I didn't have either the availability or the ability to actually travel to Europe for this, but we were certainly using London sources through much of this and that anymore is relatively widely available online. Um, it's of significance that even after the Somerset versus Stewart decision is rendered at the Court of King's Bench, people are under the, the uh, uh, false assumption that this immediately ended slavery in the United Kingdom, and regrettably, it did not. There were perhaps 20,000 enslaved persons living in Great Britain itself at the time of the American Revolution, but on the heels of Somerset, perhaps half of those people simply walked away from their positions and they were not molested at all. They were just allowed to walk away, but about half of them remained uh, enslaved under, uh, under British tradition more than British law. It really was not until 1837 that Great Britain officially put an end to chattel slavery throughout the British Empire. Oh, so way before us. Um, so in all of your research, um, I know you've been work, putting a lot of work into this, but have you found any tidbits leading you to your next project? I know a lot of writers find in their first project seeds for more. What's your, what are you working on now? Well, there are plenty of seeds available. Um, I know one issue that I, I will accept criticism for, and that is the lack of women involved in, in this story. Um, and that uh, regrettably is because of the lack of documentation about a lot of women's input in American history at that time. But I will tell you that John Adams throughout his long adult life realized that at any event where his wife accompanied him, there was no chance that he had to be the smartest person in the room. <laughs> Abigail so surpassed him and he knew it. It was a source of admiration and <laughs> at the same time, some resentment throughout their long life together. He, he, he truly loved Abigail, but he was also extremely envious of her intellect. Uh, so, and that's just one uh, uh, of a multiple of women that are involved on the, uh, on, on the edges of this story. So that is certainly forthcoming. One of the appendices actually focuses on two uh, adolescent girls that, oh together produced the American Revolution. And I'm just gonna leave that to you as a teaser, but we don't get a, an American Revolution without these two 12 year old girls. Well, you've got me, I'm hooked. Um, I'm <laughs> I love finding secret histories about women. Oh, we just got another question pop up. Um, there was a reference to the Ohio River as French, but by 1774, it had been lost to Britain due to the French and Indian War, which ended around 1763. Please explain. Okay. To a great degree, yes, that is true, but the French traders never left. And remarkably enough, and that would, was going to play out just where we cut off the dialogue, uh, as it turned out, uh, Fort Pitt, which we now know as Pittsburgh, had already been sold from the British to the Americans. So ironically, by 1775, the Americans owned Fort Pitt. And from there, they were literally controlling the Ohio River for the remainder of the American Revolution. This is not mere conjecture. The man that uh, Franklin talks about, Oliver Pollock, did indeed successfully sail ships up the Mississippi and up the Ohio. And he did indeed bring munitions, not only to Fort Pitt, but he supplied George Rogers Clark with all of his ammunition on the, uh, on the Kaskaskia expedition. So this is not fantasy. This is, this is uh, the true reality of what was going on during the American Revolution. Oliver Pollock was actually moving munitions and materiel up the Mississippi and up the Ohio, unmolested by the British. Um, all right, well, thank you. Um, if we don't have any other questions, um, I see that Joe has put the link again in the chat to where you can pick up this audiobook, um, experience it in full, um, or you can wait and in February or March, you'll get the uh, written version are coming out um, on the same link. So 
whichever your preference is, your reading preference is. Um, thank you so much for being with us tonight, Philip. Um, uh, we so appreciate learning about this little known part of history. Um, uh, let me see, do I need to say anything else? Nope. Um, if you guys enjoyed this and want to share the link tomorrow, it will be on our YouTube channel. Uh, thank you all for being with us, for letting us into your homes. Um, we'll be with you again very soon, hopefully in person at some point, but until then we will be, we will be here. Oh, we got one more question. Um, oh, just a comment. Clark waged two campaigns against Pequot, Ohio and Indians. I very much, we got a lot of history buffs here in the audience, so I That's love great. That. That's great. I um, so always love to hear from them. Share with your history buff friends. <laughs> Um, and uh, we'll look forward to your next book about women. I, you know, like I said, I'm very excited about that. Um, I hope you guys all have a wonderful evening. Um, and good night. That's all we have for you. Thank you, Ellie. <laughs>